On a chilly December day in 2010, the tranquil city of Bristol, England, was forever marked by a haunting mystery that would capture the nation's attention. Greg Reardon got back home at 44 Cannings Road after his weekend in the north at about 8 p.m. on Sunday 19th December 2010. He expected to catch up with his girlfriend to watch their favorite show at 9 p.m., but there was no sign of her. When he tried calling to remind her about the show, her phone rang from just meters away in their home. Greg immediately realized that something was wrong. From there on wards, what will follow is a story filled with twists, dark secrets, shattered dreams, and the incredibly heartbreaking fate of an innocent 25-year-old girl. This is a case that shook and split Bristol's community as never before. This is the case of Joanna Yates. Joanna Yates, known to friends and family as Joe, was a bright and promising 25-year-old. Born on April 19, 1985, in Hampshire, England, to her parents David and Teresa Yates. She received her education at Embley Park near Romsey, attending Peter Simons College for her A-levels. She successfully earned a degree in landscape architecture from Riddle College and furthered her education by obtaining a postgraduate diploma in landscape architecture from the University of Gloucestershire. Joanna was described by her closest as instantly likable and easygoing, and quote, she just made everyone feel at ease around her. Joe was very rarely in an unhappy mood and was very good at shrugging things off and getting on with life. In 2008, Yates met 25-year-old architect Greg Reardon at the firm Highland Edgar Driver in Winchester, they started dating on 11th December 2008 and moved in together in 2009. Yates and Reardon later changed jobs to work at the Building Design Partnership in Bristol. They moved into a flat at 44 Canning Road, a large house that had been subdivided into several such flats in the city's Clifton suburb in October 2010. We were both really happy in our jobs. We worked together and that's how we met, said Reardon. And quote, I thought we would be together forever. She was my future. On Friday 17th of December 2010, CCTV captured pictures showing Joanna Yates and Greg Reardon setting off for work through the snow. The working day went well as usual, and they were spotted together for the final time at approximately 6 p.m. in the office lobby. He kissed her goodbye before she went on to meet her colleagues from Building Design Partnership for an evening get-together at the Bristol Ram Pub, while he proceeded to 44 Canning's Road to prepare for a family visit trip to Peak District. As the evening progressed, Joanna decides it's time to head home. She's taking a casual walk from the city center back to her place in Clifton, which usually takes around 20 minutes. It's a peaceful evening, and she's in good spirits. Around 8.10 p.m., Joanna makes a brief stop at a nearby Waitrose supermarket. It's unclear exactly why she stopped there, but the security cameras capture her, just doing a quick errand. At 8.30 p.m., Joanna gives her best friend, Rebecca Scott, a call. They chat about their plans for Christmas Eve, sharing stories and laughter. Joanna seems excited to meet up with her friend soon. At 8.40 p.m., Joanna heads to a Tesco Express close to her flat in Clifton Village. She grabs pizza and two bottles of cider. Little does she know that this seemingly ordinary night is about to take a sad turn. The police's belief is that then she went back to her apartment on Keninja Road. Within moments, at about 8.50 p.m., party-goers heading to a nearby house heard two screams, and then silence. Greg Reardon returned to the apartment on 44 Cannons Road, at approximately 8.30 p.m. on December 19th, Joanna was nowhere to be seen. He placed a call to her mobile phone, and he could hear it ringing from within her coat pocket. In addition to this discovery, Greg also stumbled upon Joanna's purse, glasses, and keys. Concerned and anxious, 
He took the step of reporting Joanna's disappearance to both the police and her parents around midnight. Inside the apartment, investigators located the receipt from Joanna's pizza purchase. Strangely, the pizza packaging remained missing, indicating that she likely hadn't consumed it. Equally mysterious was the absence of the pizza itself, which couldn't be located. Both bottles of cider were recovered, one had been partially consumed, while the other remained unopened. Notably, there were no signs of forced entry or any indications of a disturbance having occurred within the apartment. As part of their standard procedure, investigators also conducted examinations of Greg's laptop and mobile phone. However, no evidence of any incriminating nature was discovered on either device. As of December 21st, there were still no additional leads regarding Joanna's whereabouts. During a heartfelt press conference, Joanna's parents, David and Teresa, conveyed their deep anguish and disbelief over her sudden vanishing. They issued an emotional plea, earnestly urging Joanna to reach out, assuring her of their unwavering love and profound concern for her safety. Present alongside them were Joanna's brother, Chris, as well as Greg. On Christmas Day, their worst fears came true. A couple walking their dog along Longwood Lane in Fayland, around four miles from Joanna's Clifton flat, found a body by the roadside, covered in snow and dressed. On the 26th, it was confirmed that the body belonged to Joanna. The post-mortem examination started that day, but faced delays because Joanna's body was frozen. By the 28th, the pathologist determined that Joanna had died from strangulation. Joanna was fully dressed, but she wasn't wearing a coat, and one sock was missing. This sock was a long, gray ski sock, and it couldn't be found in her flat or anywhere near where her body was discovered. The sock became a crucial part of the investigation, with detectives believing that the killer might have kept it as a trophy. Christopher Jeffries, a 65-year-old retired English teacher at local private school Clifton College, was well known in the community. Jeffries was Joanna and Greg's landlord and lived in the flat above them. He was active with the local Liberal Democrats, helping out in election campaigns, and was also heavily involved in the neighborhood watch scheme in Clifton. Jeffries was an eccentric character, sometimes making bold statements such as dyeing his hair blue, Former students described him as an unconventional but inspiring teacher. Jeffries became involved in the murder investigation of Joanna Yates when he was questioned over claims he'd made to neighbors about seeing three people when he drove up outside Joanna's flat at around 9 p.m. The neighbors told investigators that Jeffries had said he had seen Joanna, however. Jeffries clarified that he had not specifically seen Joanna, but rather had only seen three people. Jeffries was taken into custody on the morning of December 30th, 2010, on suspicion of murder. The media had a frenzy over Jeffries' arrest. The main reason for this seemed to be the fact that Jeffries had an admittedly unusual appearance and eccentric demeanor. In a column for The Guardian, Stephen Moss noted that there was an underlying assumption that someone who looked as odd as Jeffries couldn't possibly be innocent. There were a range of defamatory headlines splashed across the front page's UK rags including... Quote, Professor Strange, the strange Mr. Jeffries, landlord of the murdered Joanna Yates and a suspect peeping Tom. After being questioned by detectives for two days, Jeffries was released on bail on January 1st, 2011. Understandably, once he was no longer a suspect in the murder investigation, Jeffries sued eight UK newspapers for libel. His lawyer spoke out on the matter. Christopher Jeffries, is the latest victim of the regular witch hunts and character assassinations conducted by the worst elements of the British tabloid media. Jeffries received substantial damages from the papers, as well as a public apology from police. Vincent Tabak, a 32-year-old Dutch national employed as an engineer in Bristol, resided in the flat next to Joanna and Greg, along with his girlfriend, Tanya Morrison. In response to Greg's report of Joanna's disappearance, police visited Tabak's flat around 4 a.m. 
on December 19th. Tabak was questioned about his knowledge of Joanna's whereabouts, to which he replied that he had no information. On the 23rd, law enforcement conducted a search of Tabak's flat with his full cooperation. The search yielded no pertinent evidence in the ongoing investigation. On the 24th, Tabak and Morrison traveled to Cambridge to spend time with her family. During this period, Tabak conversed with a detective over the phone, affirming that he had remained at home until he fetched his girlfriend in the early morning of the 19th following a night out. He also reiterated that he had no acquaintance with Joanna. On the 28th, Tabak and Morrison embarked on a journey to Netherlands via the Eurotunnel, intending to celebrate New Year's with his family. While there, they watched a news report about the arrest of Jeffries on suspicion of murder. Out of nowhere, Tabak contacted detectives, providing information that insinuated Jeffries had ventured out several times on the night Joanna disappeared, claiming to have observed Jeffries' car facing different directions at various points during the evening. In response, DC Karen Thomas traveled to Netherlands the following day engaging Tabak in a six-hour conversation. During this conversation, Tabak's behavior raised suspicions. He altered his account of his activities that night, asserting that he had ventured out to capture snow photographs and visit Asda, in addition to picking up his girlfriend. He also displayed an unusual curiosity about the ongoing forensic examinations. At DC Thomas's request, Tabak provided a DNA sample and underwent fingerprinting. Upon their return to the UK on January 2, 2011, Tabak strongly believed he would be apprehended. However, it wasn't until the early hours of January 20th that Tabak was indeed arrested for Joanna Yates' murder. Forensic examinations had unveiled the presence of Tabak's DNA on the victim's body. Initially, Tabak vehemently maintained that the DNA results were fabricated by corrupt officials attempting to frame him, but he eventually abandoned this assertion. On January 22nd, after enduring days of questioning by detectives, Tabak was formally charged with the murder of Joanna Yates. On May 5, 2011, Tabak pleaded guilty to manslaughter, but denied murder. His plea of manslaughter was rejected, and it was determined that he would be trialed for murder in October 2011. The trial started on October 10, 2011, in front of a jury and Mr. Justice Field. Throughout the investigation and trial, Tabak kept saying he didn't know how Joanna got all those injuries. There were 43 of them on her neck, body, head, and arms. The prosecution said Tabak meant to kill Joanna when he went into her flat that night. It wasn't an accident. They said he used enough force to strangle her, meaning he could have stopped, but he didn't. Tabak's defense was that it wasn't about sex, and he didn't plan to kill her. He said she made a flirty comment and invited him for a drink at her flat. When he got inside, he tried to kiss her, but she screamed. To stop her, he put his hand over her mouth. He took it away, but she kept screaming, so he put his hand back over her mouth and his other hand around her throat. It happened unintentionally but she died. This was just another attempt by the criminal to justify his sick nature and try to get out of the sentence he deserves. Vincent Tabak had strangled Joanna Yates at her flat within minutes of her arrival home on 17th of December 2010, using sufficient force to kill her. The prosecutor stated that Tabak, around a foot taller than Yates, had used his height and build to overpower her pinning her to the floor by the wrists, and that she had suffered 43 separate injuries to her head, neck, torso, and arms during the struggle. The injuries included cuts, bruises, and a fractured nose. They told the court that the struggle was lengthy, and her death would have been slow and painful, referring to the facts told to them by the specialists who examined the body. Then, he put her body in his car's trunk and went to Asda, where he bought beer and chips. Later, he went to Longwood Lane and left her body there, which was found on Christmas Day. The jury thought about it for three days and decided Tabak was guilty of killing Joanna Yates, with ten people agreeing and two disagreeing. Tabak got a life sentence with a minimum of 20 years.
During his sentencing, Mr. Justice Field talked about there being a sexual element in the killing. During the trial, the jury didn't hear about violent stuff Tabak watched on his computer before the murder. They found out about it after the trial. They also found out he had over 100 bad pictures of kids. Lastly, after Joanna's death, he googled stuff like, when does the garbage get picked up? And how long for a body to decompose? But in the end, Joanna's dreams remained just that. Dreams because of one truly sick and heartless individual. Her future, full of potential, was stolen away, leaving her family, friends, and all who knew her with a profound sense of loss. We will remember Joanna not only for the life she lived, but for the dreams she held, the love she gave, and the promise that was never fulfilled. For Joanna's heartbroken family, the impact was devastating, and in a moving interview one year on, Greg revealed he believed they would have gone on to marry. In a statement, they said, We will never get over our loss, how she was murdered, and the total lack of respect with which her body was treated. We so miss her happy voice and seeing her living life to the full. It took nearly a year for Joanna's mother, Teresa, to be able to set foot in the flat she died in to sort through her daughter's possessions. She said, Going into your daughter's flat, which was once so full of love and laughter, but knowing it was the place where she lost her life so violently, was a tough ordeal. We, from Artificial Investigation, are deeply sorry for the loss and tragic passing of Joanna Yates. She will be remembered, not just for her untimely departure, but for the light she brought into the lives of those who knew her. Her story is undeniably moving, and that's why we decided to make our first video based on it. It's a poignant reminder of the preciousness of life and the impact one person can have on those around them. It's a story that leaves a lasting impression, urging us to cherish every moment and honor the memory of those we've lost.